You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. Hmm. All right, everybody. Go. Well, this Go is engage. episode 65 of Arsenal Pass. Hayden is newly uh, newly engaged, apparently. Found out on the, uh, the old book. Um, today we're going to be talking about choosing a hero in flesh and blood. And then parentheses, classic constructed. So we're not talking about Blitz Heroes, just, just CC today. First, so hey, let me let's talk about your week in Flesh and Blood. I had a road to nationals this weekend, which actually I had two road to nationals this past week. So a bit of Flesh and Blood, which is nice. New set, uprising, enjoying a lot. So I had a draft. I talked about it actually on the the pod last week. I had a road to nationals draft coming up. Played that. That was some awesome fun. Uh, so two pods of draft into a top eight draft, and I got taken down in the quarterfinals by the one and only Tall Timmy. The Tall Timmy took me down. He actually has. Up until a draft we did on Monday night, he had a three and zero limited record against me, so uh, got taken down by the tall to me. Uh, to be frank, I would have been surprised if you had won. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he, Paul's a good player; he's very underrated. So had said, that, and then I also had a classic constructed road to nationals on the Sunday as well, and um, managed to to take it out with Viserai. So I had a lot of fun playing a Viserai deck, which we're going to do a deck deck on this week. So look out for that. Kind of just skimped over that one, but you said Paul and. Um... That's actually news to me. I, I legitimately, I guess I just figured his name was Timmy. Um, wow, what a what a shock. Um, so yeah, for me, I played some I played some drafts this week. Uh, some private drafts so with locals. So we got to do like three of them. Um, we drafted one. We would draft and then we play one game. Um, and my takeaway from that was, I need to draft less and play more <laughs> because my agency over the like the agency over the draft format and the impact of me playing more and more seems to have like a massive diminishing return where it seems like on like the gameplay and the micro side, um, there's a lot of room to improve. And yeah, I think so both Sasha and I came to that conclusion last time we were sort of reviewing draft VODs, um, which I thought was really interesting. Never had a format like that quite yet. And um, yeah, so now we're just going to move forward. We're going to just bring our draft decks to testing and just kind of play more. Um, certainly we'll circle back to, to drafting and trying to, uh, you know, figure out if we're forcing or what we're picking early and also just tier list pick of cards. That's like super important, um, which we haven't gotten around to yet. Excited for that. It's quite, a, it's quite a, like the, the format, the, the little like bits and pieces that happen and the kind of edges and stuff. It's very nuanced. Like I do think this format is going to go down as kind of one of the best formats for bringing players into the game. Like in terms of, you know, we've got players showing up on a Wednesday at Armory and, hey, we're doing a draft tonight, but don't worry. Like, this format is great for that. You know, like, I think it will honestly go down as that, which is cool. But then from, like, the, I guess, looking to a competitive side, like, there's a lot of nuances and stuff. So, um, also also really cool. So, yeah. I found it particularly interesting with, like, uh, in regards to draft archetypes. I found it to be a bit more shallow than other formats. They don't exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I they felt like you were do. you were building it up to have like you know the, the comma but you know and then we we're gonna hit that part. We'll talk about that later. Um anyway, Hayden, why don't you why don't we just head into the news here? Yeah, pretty light week on the news front. Uh bulletins are slow on. Battleheart in Portland has been announced and is happening on August twelfth. So if you are in the you know, I guess it's the Pacific Northwest, right? If you're in that area, uh make sure you get up to Portland. I think it's being done by Fabled Hobby, uh, I think is their name. And um 12th of August to the 14th, obviously a battle hardened event there should be should be a good time. So if you are uh, go and check it out, <clears throat> I believe you can head to <clears throat> excuse me fabtcg.com and register uh, through their link there. And then that's kind of it for like I guess announcements and news. But Brendan, I think it's time for a fitness challenge update. If people aren't aware, Brendan, maybe just tell us just a little bit about the Fab Fitness Challenge. And I mean, it's been it's day six for me. I know it's day five for you. It's really taken on a life of its own and just been an amazing... I was talking to Flake. I did the Instant Speed podcast and I was talking to Flake about this, but it's been an amazing experience already. And I just want, you know, from your perspective, maybe to, to give us a bit of an update and talk about what's happening in the Fab Fitness Challenge. Any dates or anything that we should know about? Yeah, so day five should be coming out of the honeymoon phase of anybody's plans and goals, starting to hit reality with it being not fun. So if you're pushing through now, it's the most important part. Um, in my opinion, you got to get over that 15-day hump. We just closed it out real strong. But yeah, the reception has you know you could you could kind of assume that there would be some sort of reception some people would join and whatever whatever what what ended up happening is probably 10x that 
at least. Um, it's absolutely incredible. Not only in the Arsenal Pass Discord, we have a few channels set up for the fitness challenge, but just on Twitter, people are posting videos. There's hashtag Fab Fitness Challenge. Like it's absolutely all over the place. I remember the first couple of days, I. I actually spent like multiple hours on Twitter trying to go through some of the tags and go through like the hashtag fat fitness challenge. And I couldn't get through it all. Like there was so much. Um, and we've just seen some incre incredible initiatives from specific community members as well, which has been awesome to see in regards to the challenge and updates on our end. So tomorrow, actually, um, this will be the day before this gets released. So if you're hanging out, you might've missed it in the Arsenal pass, uh, Patreon discord, we're doing a group call, um, tomorrow afternoon just to talk about where we are, our goals, what we're struggling with, what's easy, et cetera, et cetera, and just kind of hang out. Um, but yeah, and from, from like a 10,000 feet perspective, we still got a lot of the month to go. Um, engagement is incredible. Keep it up. It's awesome. I try to reply to everything. I'm even trying to do like little personalized video replies. Um, but yeah, once we get closer to that end uh, to that end date of the month, I will be sort of reaching out to the community to ask for nominations and just recommendations for people that we should go ahead and reward with some of the prizes that we'll be giving out. I know in addition, there's going to be other content creators that will be giving out uh, prizes as well. Mm -hmm. Team Covenant reached out to me, said they would give out some of their promos um, and other content creators are doing the same. So, hey, and the update is going strong, incredible reception, and uh, the th it's so much bigger than what I thought it would ever be and, e and me that, um, yeah, I'm just happy to see see it right now. It's so cool. Like, um, you know, I want to give a big shout out to you, Brendan, because you are the one who's been the driving force behind this. People have asked me questions. To be honest, I have done very little. It's it's Brendan who's been driving all this. He's set up everything. He's uh, been the engager. He's um, chatting with, like you say, other content creators to, to, to push it out there. And I mean, the response is, like you say, it's wild. I think we have nearly 200 people in our Discord who have who have uh, signed up to, to participate or, you know, are in the channels to participate. And I think between Twitter, between Everyone else's discords. I know the attack action has one. You know, Flake has one on his. There's just you know so many people involved, which is just amazing to see. And I think it's um it's so cool that as a community we can step outside of flesh and blood. And you know, I think it is such a strong community, and this really shows it how supportive people are of, of one another in this community. And that we can we can go beyond that and think about our our wellness, our health. Um, you know, a, a month to come together and, and challenge and push each other to maybe achieve some things that we that we want to do, uh, no matter what those are. From you know for me personally it's a really small change with like my sleep schedule and a, a bit of calorie counting this month to some really big um challenges that people are putting in front of themselves which is so cool to see and i can't wait to see not only what happens this month but just you know i think we're going to see some life-changing impacts out of this for some people and that's that's amazing so shout out to you brendan good uh, good stuff love to see it yeah if we could even contribute one percent to somebody making a positive change in their life for the long run, I think that everything is worth it. So it's incredible to see the effort that people are putting out, and I'm super excited to keep continuing this month. Anyway, Hayden, speaking of calorie cotton, uh, this might not fit in your macros. We got a we got an old shrimpy on the Barbie. What is it for the Command and Cookout section today? Well, we we have a great Command and Cookout because you reached out to the community this week, our Discord community, and said. What should we podcast about this week? And this, this, what we are podcasting about today came directly from one of our patrons, um, which I'm sure you've got the name of Brendan and I'm ready to shout out before we get to the main topic. But before we get to the command and cooker, I do just want to give a quick, while we're shouting out our Patreon community, massive shout out to all of our patrons. Uh, all that you allow us to do and enable us to do. I mean, things like, uh, you know, the fitness challenge, for instance, I mean, how we're able to drive that in our community. Um, you know, all the extra content that we're able to do from deck text to our monthly pod, which we just three days ago on saturday so when we record three four days ago we just did drop our uh current monthly pod for the past month which we talked about something that i think is, is quite cool kind of this this idea that i've had and i talked to brendan about which is uh reactive sort of uh now i've forgotten already it's a bit about proactiveness and in, in playing flesh and blood and how you can play your games a bit more proactively i think and approach flesh and blood from a, a proactive standpoint so yeah just thank you to all of the patrons and uh you know you're all amazing come on and cook out brendan as you say on the grill or as the Barbie, as we call it over here. Got a question from the Tickler Foundry. If you, uh, this came from Discord as well. Check out the Tickler Foundry is on YouTube. Does some really cool content around Reiner and uh, Dash that I've seen as well. Their question is, how can the community have a more constructive criticism of gameplay and product design? When should we recognize that it's not only beneficial for us as players, but also LSS? I've noticed whenever people criticize Fab, it's met with hostility and constant comparisons to other games that are worse, usually Magic the Gathering is the example. And I don't think that's healthy a healthy attitude towards the game. 
On the flip side, usually the selling point of Flesh and Blood, from what they've seen online and in conversations, is to be overly negative about the other games on the market. So how can we learn to appreciate all TCGs out there and how their design helps us to get better at the game? Now, I thought this was a great question uh, from the Tickler Foundry. It's not, you know, it's not a, it's not a level up related question. It's not based on Flesh and Blood gameplay or meta game or anything specifically. But I do think this is a really great question because I personally, Brendan, for me, I think the discourse around the game has become a lot more constructive yeah, as better. we've gone through. I, yeah, I think people are, to be honest, I think there was a, when the game first started and we were early on, we had a lot of, you know, we had some loud voices in there. I don't want to say a lot. We had some loud voices in there who were really vocal about certain things. And I think as the game has grown and expanded, the community is kind of, I don't know, like self-moderating, but, you know, people are, people are able to talk constructively and say, you know, this is what's good about the game. This is what's not. And it's that's a good thing to have. You know, there are th- points about Flesh and Blood that are not good. There are things that do not work. There are things that have caused issues. But at the end of the day, in my, from my perspective, I think they're massively outweighed by the positives and what Alexis is doing now. I think going forward, I, I think this is really important discourse to have continued. So I want to, like my kind of, I guess what I want to say from this question is, I think we should encourage this kind of discourse. But, you know, if people are being jerks about it, just, you know, just let them know, hey, you know, don't really, not really necessary. Don't need to talk about it that way. Let's be constructive. We don't need to be purely negative all the time. Let's talk about, like, I love, for instance, when like Tarek talks about the game, right? I think he's critical of the game, but he does it in a very fair way. He also loves the game and he uh, looks at it from, I think, a very, uh, you know, he takes a lens of being very constructive with his criticism as well, which I think is great. So, and I think you do the same, Brendan, when, when you talk about some of the, the pitfalls you've had about, you know, let's talk about, uh, registration for events in North America. I think you've been very constructive, always offered ways to maybe fix those problems, come with some solutions. And I think that's really important. So for me, to answer uh, the Tickler Foundry's question, <clears throat> I think the the discourse has become a lot better. And I think people are understanding how to, you know, talk more and allow people who have voices and have important things to say that are criticisms or are positives at the game, and, you know, boosting those people up. And some of the louder voices that we maybe had at the start that were, uh, I guess maybe tore down other games, you know, oh, it's not magic, whatever, it's not Yu-Gi-Oh, it's not this, um, or comparing, comp- contrasting. It's a very different game, and I think all TCG players have different histories, all Flesh and Blood players have different histories. Brendan, you've had you know, little to no history apart from magic. Other players come from five or six different ones. I came from magic. You know, everyone has different backgrounds, and I think it's important that uh, we kind of recognize that as well. Yeah, it's pretty incredible how <laughs> we didn't degenerate from the initial sort of I love it. So loud voices lucky. and aggressive criticism we had in the early days, even in like the mid early days, <laughs> a couple of sets in. But now, yeah, it was weird when I was hearing this question, I had to like, I was actually thinking, I was like, have I even seen this stuff recently? And the answer is actually no, surprisingly. Does it exist? Probably. Um, but for some reason, it's not rising to the top where this, that kind of criticism, you know, extreme criticism being very far onto one side and really holding your opinion in terms of from like a content creator angle can, can really work. Usually it does tend to rise to the top in terms of views. Uh, but we, we just don't see a lot of that. And I think that that helps sort of the overall sentiment for the game and like the general thoughts about design and uh, current OP tends to be more positive because most people are talking positively about it. And I think fundamentally, a lot of us just have a lot of faith in the studio. Um, you know, a lot of us got into the game for that reason. And we ultimately think they'll steer us in the right direction. So sometimes things will be a bit suboptimal, but I find the flesh and blood community to be very understanding. And I do think that it is important in regards to other games and tearing down other games for the sake of fab. I feel like we've sort of outgrown that, right? In the beginning, it was kind of popular because, you know, it's like magic is, you'd say like magic is high variance and they don't have an OP and it's like all this stuff is just like bad about magic. So therefore you should play fab. I think it's more like all these things are great about fab. So therefore you should come play fab. I think that many games can exist at once. Um, and that sort of harmonious existence just is better for all of them, right? We don't, there's, there's definitely enough people who aren't TCG players who can become TCG players who don't need to start, you know, putting down other communities. So I actually think that this stuff has trended in the right direction in Flesh and Blood. Um, and I think it will continue for a while. Yeah, I, I think so too. They, look, and to, and I don't want to dismiss uh, the Tickle Foundry's question. I think there is definitely some of that still out there. And my answer to the original question, which is how can the community have a more constructive criticism of gameplay and product decisions? I think it's to be led by the community, to be honest, is to engage in those conversations and have them in respectful manners. And yourself, you know, Tickler Foundry, as someone who creates content, I think that's, you know, you can help do that as well. So, um, but I do think that the community has driven this, right? Like, I guess people who 
you know, want to speak badly about the game, more than entitled to. But I, I think sometimes what we have is like, you know, like you say, I think it's just become less and less in terms of this like overly negative perspective because everyone loves the game who's kind of engaged in this conversation. And as much as they might have critiques and 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 positives, they're, they're done in a, I think, quite a respectful manner, which is, is great to see. So, yeah, I hope we continue to always have critiques and criticism and, and constructive feedback because that's super important to the flow of the game. And I, I think, and I, I, I mean, I know because they've told me, Legend Story Studios listen to what the community is saying. So it is it is a really important part of that feedback loop. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you for the question, the Tickler Foundry. If you want to get your questions in to the Commander Cookout section, you can do it in whatever way you want. Uh, email us at arsenalpassfab at gmail.com. Drop us a, a note on Twitter. Drop it in the YouTube comments below or on our Discord. And, um, you know, the Tickler Foundry's question wasn't originally a Commander Cookout, but I repurposed it, and we thank you for your question. So, Brendan, pass over to you main topic this week yeah so the main topic this week comes from parker in our discord and it is choosing a hero in flesh and blood um so there's obviously a lot that goes into this hayden on multiple sides of this uh, kind of a spectrum right you have the more role play or even casual side of the spectrum and then you have this sort of competitive and spike just just want to win at all costs right i think most players probably exist somewhere in the middle that being said, I think the goal of us talking about each hero as we go down this list is more to give you an idea of generally how they play and what sort of buckets and archetypes they kind of fit into. So if you are coming from another game, maybe like Magic the Gathering, we can split things into you know three macro groups, right? Like um, control, mid-range, and aggro. And obviously there's a lot of subgroups that come off of that, but just helping you understand from like 10,000 feet, it's like if I'm going to play Azalea, what am I in for, right? Am I going to be playing a control deck? Probably not at this case. Anyway, I have a, f I have a couple questions to start this off with you uh, first. And it's, do you think it's better? And we've answered this question actually quite a few times over the uh, the year and whatever time we've been doing this podcast. But do you think it's better to choose one hero and stick to it? Or should you play as many heroes as possible? Let's talk about this from two angles, right? From the competitive point of view and then from just like a pure casual game uh, uh game enjoyment point of view all right i'm going to answer your question but then i'm going to flip the script on you quickly and i and i want to ask you a question on the back of this which i think is super important to this episode because i think as well in this episode you know you could take this from a this is a great way to look at what hero might fit you right but it's also great if you play other heroes to to consider you know what is the be all and end all or where could you go in other classes and heroes in this game but anyway i'll get to that i this is, I mean, yeah, like you say, we've answered this question multiple times and my answer, I wouldn't say it always changes, but I always have different thought processes about whether you should choose one hero and stick with it or whether you should play as many as possible. And I think ultimately it just, it depends on the person. That's that's going to be my answer. I think it was my answer last time as well. I'm, I'm sticking to it because for, I think it depends what you want to get out of the game first and foremost, right? Like if you want to play this game at maybe a, a, a store level, kitchen table level to a skirmish level, Sticking with one hero might be the thing that, that you want to do, and that might work really well for you. You might also want to explore different heroes. You know, each set, I'm going to pick a hero to play or a class to play, and I'm going to learn more about that. On the flip side, you could be a super competitive player, and you could also pick one hero or one class to play and really dedicate yourself to that. But you might also be open to playing other things. I think once you get to maybe a, a high competitive level, you do need to be a little bit more open, at least because you need to understand how other heroes work or how other classes work. Sometimes you might just need to make a decision to, to play a different hero or class if you if you do want to do well. But I think if you want to choose between sticking to a hero, maybe playing somewhere in between where you have two to three heroes or having you know playing all the heroes, you should decide what your end goal is and what you want to get out of it. But I think for the majority of people, I think it's having a main hero, but then having you know a handful of heroes that you can play outside of that. And maybe it even as a case of like one per set or something. Mm-hmm. Can, can I flip a question to you, though, Brendan? Uh, actually, first of all, what do you think about this? And then I'll, I'll, I'll question you. All right, I got to preface this with, I asked the question to your Hayden, not you, no. Um, so, yeah, what do I think? Uh, it's pretty much on the same line. Um, I, I'm going to approach it from two, the, the two angles, right? So from casual perspective, I do think that it's it's quite rewarding to play a lot of heroes because you could just play flesh and blood in vastly different ways that's a good thing about this game is like a mech and all just plays you know if you're using items and think that like that will play fundamentally different from like a rune blade deck or something like that wizard is just on its in a whole other universe in terms of like how it actually plays the game and tries to interact prism is very different i think it can be fun to get that different perspective of the game and just play it in different ways 
From a one hero perspective, obviously it's very economical, you'll be very comfortable, and you'll probably get pretty good at your hero, even if you're playing at a store level or a kitchen level. If you're just playing one hero um, and you stay up to date and you're actually trying to improve, you're probably going to get pretty good. Um, from a competitive perspective, I if we were if we were to go back like two, three sets, yes, I would tell you you should probably be playing every single hero. Nowadays, there's so many heroes that I feel like you should know how to play every hero. You should understand how they work, but you should specialize in some. And not necessarily a hero, but maybe a class, maybe an archetype, something like that. I find that most testing groups approach it from that perspective for competitive play because the game has just I don't know. Every time they've, every time they added a new hero, it's almost like it's not a linear kind of addition to the game's complexity. I wouldn't say it's quite exponential, but it's somewhere in between. It adds a lot, <laughs> right? There's so much depth right. to each hero. So I think that specializing, uh, but still making sure that you're well rounded as a player in terms of your understanding of the game, uh, I think that's the best way to approach it competitively. I think I think for a competitive return, I think you're right. Like I think this idea of knowing you know a few heroes inside now and then partnering yourself with people who know some of the other maybe meta players inside now and then you know if something else rises in the meta because things change drastically like all of a sudden you know uh bolton becomes one of the the premier decks in the format because a, a card gets printed or something happens with the format then you know learn that right like you have the tools then to in the space and the sort of like i guess the yeah like basically the the, the mental real estate to be able to learn that because it's like well, actually, Bolton's come up and also Levia's come up this format, but I, I played a bit of Brute. Like, I, I understand Levia to a degree. Now I'm going to spend some time with Bolton. And, and these are just, yeah, you know, I'm just using examples of two heroes I would love to see be good in the meta, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> and what could happen? But yeah, I, I think it's it's very interesting. And I know you want to talk a bit about, I guess, like the benefits and stuff of that. So I might let you do that before I, I, before I question you about what I wanted to ask about. So we kind of touched on it, but I just want to I just want to shine a light on some competitive players that actually mass that kind of mostly play one hero and actually do it to success in metas where that hero might not be the best. Um, so we're looking at like Kale McCree for Bravo and Guardian. Um, we have Yuki Yuki Bender for Lexi, and there's probably a plethora more. Alex Four for Kano. He top eight of the Pro Tour as well. He's actually been playing Kano since the beginning because and I'm just gonna tell a little anecdote here because it's freaking hilarious. I used to run a Discord online webcam tournament every single Monday that me and Dante Del Fico would stream, and Alex Four would play in them every single time. And he kept making the top eight with Kano, but he would his webcam was his freaking phone on portrait mode, so not landscape portrait mode. And then he used a piece of printer paper and then Nerf darts for his uh, for his tunic counters. And he would not fix it. I was like, Alex, if, I've got, if you're if you're gonna play the finals, you gotta fix your dang setup. It's so bad. And he's like, Nah, I know, man. I'm gonna do it. And he just he was crushing even back then. But he was playing Kano, and I think that's like his main hero. And he takes it to a pro tour top eight, wins the team calling, also playing Kano. Uh, there's examples of people you know, really specializing in one hero and seeing a lot of success with it, regardless of what everybody else in the game thinks or regardless of what the what direction the meta's going. Yeah, I will I will shout out though with Alex you know, with Alex. One thing is that I know in the lead up to that Pro Tour, he was testing Chain a lot. Like he was prepared to play a different hero and learn it inside and out and be ready for that Pro Tour on, you know, I guess a perceived meta deck right so i think there's a balancing act right and i know kale has played some kale might be the ultimate <laughs> sort of interpretation of that and i think yuki uh, she was the same she was looking at playing a uh, chain and other things and then you know defaulted to i guess like a comfort pick something that felt really natural and and that is the advantage of being i guess a, a specialist or at least having a main hero is like well you know the meta feels kind of like even i think there's a deck you know that i could swap to and play but actually my, my main hero has like a reasonable time in this format and i can build it in a way to attack that and i feel super comfortable playing it and that is one of the great things about this game is that you can do that is that in almost any meta game your main hero that you may or may not have can probably be somewhat viable now you know i know for like me for me this is reinar and, and sometimes this feels like difficult but generally i'm like yeah i could play it um but for you know me personally i i like playing a spread i like playing to uh, different interactions and options so it, i think it depends on ultimately who you are as a person what you want to get out of it and um, how comfortable you feel mm -hmm. so brendan i want to ask you a quick question before we start diving into these things because you've you've given us some beautiful notes for today i have a question for you what is choosing a hero in flesh and blood like very like very fundamental and basic but like 
what you know we've talked about i guess the the perks of being a, a specialist versus maybe broad church but what does it actually mean to choose a hero in flesh and blood like are you choosing um a, a play style are you choosing a um, identity are you choosing a specific set of cards like what are you choosing when it comes to choosing a hero in flesh and blood so the answer is probably all of those things but to drill down into it i think you're you're choosing an arsenal of play styles right a a sort of toolbox but ultimately you're picking a way you're going to spend your time while you play flesh and blood um so you need to find a play experience that you find rewarding um we can boil that down to just winning and that's fine right but for some people if the best deck is maybe old him fatigue and it's just blocking out, maybe that's just not fun to them, right? So they might have more fun playing Kano, comboing people, not interact with their opponents. Some people like might like the most interaction possible, so they want to be playing these sort of mid rangey decks or even play aggro mirrors or something like that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's if you're going to dedicate your free time to flesh and blood, it's what experience are you looking for? Mm-hmm. Love it, love it. I think it's a very good way to start. And my last question, Brendan, before, because we've got some amazing things to dive into from a class perspective and a hero perspective. If I'm an avid flesh and blood player and a competitive player and I'm an Arsenal Pass weekly listener, uh, you know, what might I get out of what we're about to talk about in this pod versus maybe I'm a newer player? Maybe just give me the kind of two perspectives. So I feel like you've built out a pod here that we're going to talk about where you've got stuff for everyone, but maybe just explain that a little bit. So from a newer play perspective, it, it really is exactly what i said it's how do you want to spend your time when you play this game um and you, a lot of newer players don't have time to sort of figure out how all the he different heroes work how they play and maybe just a little tidbit about their history because we can't avoid that on our still pass so how this is more of a more of a pot around it. how do you want to find your identity right and how do you want to win the game for more seasoned players um we're going to be breaking these down into their nuance right really diving into sort of the available the available archetypes for these heroes so for things like bolton a lot of us know bolton sabers because we sat on the other side of a of a lumina combo but there's actually other bolton decks available oh, right there. yeah there yeah. there is bolton decks and there's there's bolton saber decks that are actually successful outside of just comboing on aggro decks or something like that because mm -hmm. you, you need a strategy to be able to beat the guardians right the rest of the meta and it's like how do they do that it's usually not with the sabers um so we're just going to be dissecting the heroes a little bit and talking about their available sort of paths to victory yeah you can get some ideas and some spice from us that's for sure so nope i just wanted to, to to preface the episode with that because um i think from the title people might be like well is this the pod for me you know i'm an experienced player but i, I think we've got some stuff in here that's going to be exciting for everyone so uh take it away my fellow podcast host yeah. yeah so i talked about this uh really quickly but hayden i would define a lot of tcgs by these three pillars of play right control mid-range and aggro i just want to quickly ask you do you believe that these three sort of styles exist in flesh and blood oh my favorite question y yes and no is my answer <laughs> because i think to an extent, they do, but not in the way that we might think about it coming from a different game. So if you came from, let's just say you came from Magic, so that, that's my background. The idea of a mid-range deck is very different in Magic. I think it's about its value orientation. It's about uh, selecting cards either on a defensive or offensive standpoint that get you value. Card advantage, usually. And that card advantage is not the same in Flesh and Blood. So I think a mid-range deck looks very different. Like I would describe a mid-range deck in Flesh and Blood more as a deck that can like flex and do a defensive and an offensive job but it's not necessarily about value. It's about that game plan. I would say mid-range decks often are coined as like a deck that can do both, you know, like get, get you get you a guy that can do both, you know, like that is kind of what mid-range is in this game, I think more to an extent than uh, literally playing right in the middle of the format, to be honest. Um, they might also be a deck that can kind of disrupt. So I often think of like Lexi builds or Reinar builds as, as mid-range decks. Um, that's kind of the biggest difference I see. And then, I think the control and aggro axes of it are a lot more traditional to other decks where aggro is like kill your opponent as fast as possible with like the most efficient threats, right? Versus control is like own the game, play, you know, reasonably defensive, find avenues and then eke out advantage over a long, long, long game or to a, a win condition at the end. Yeah. And I agree with you for the most part. I think that with control, there is like a... It's hard to call it a sub strategy of fatigue because it, I feel like sure. it doesn't really fall into control. It's more attrition and it is kind of unique to flesh and blood because of the way our resource system works and how we expend cards to deal damage and they aren't persistent. Um, 
but yeah, outside of that, I think it abs- it, it does exist. It does exist, but it's in Flesh and Blood's own way. So hey, I want to talk about some sub-pillars of play. So these are things like Cheerios decks. So that was famously sort of in the Briar deck back in uh, Tales of Aria. We've got combo decks, things like Saber Bolton combo or Kano combo that showed up at the Pro Tour. Fatigue and Attrition, this could be your Oldham deck, but honestly, they can, this can slot into most, most heroes that have a lot of armor, can block three and maybe have some disruptive effects. Um, next is Tempo. Tempo exists in things like like Lexi, like Ice Lexi, but not even fully Ice, right? You can have just be splashing a bit of Ice for the channel like Frigid and things like Prism. Like Prism um, is developing persistent board states, but these uh, these auras are a form of tempo, right? Because your opponent has to expend action points to kill them, which is a finite resource unless they've teched for it and then they can get more, but still there's only so much in their deck. Um, and then last here I put was invest now, win later. So this is kind of like mid-range dash setting up items, uh, kind of, and this is a stretch, but you could call this chain, right? So you're building up your soul shackles. Maybe you make some subpar plays to put some reds at the bottom of your deck to banish later. Um, really just building up to sort of a critical maximum of power where you're going to outvalue your opponent in the late game. Well, I, I think Bolton could actually, certain builds of Bolton can actually go in that last tier you have there as well. You know, you use your, you're building up your soul over the, the course of a game to then power out three, four, five, like really big turns towards the end of the game. So, yeah. so first off, I, we're, oh, were you going to say something, sir? Oh, are we, are we still talking about the sub pillars? Because I do have some comments on the sub pillars, if that's all right, just quickly. And I Go think the one I wanted to just quickly comment on was tempo because tempo is both like it's it's this like elusive kind of concept in flesh and blood and it is something that's grander than just i think like a a sub pillar but i also think it's a great call out because those two like specific decks you talked about right there the lexi and the kind of prism aspect they probably rely i think every deck to a certain extent relies on some form of tempo um except for maybe control decks but even then uh, whereas these decks it's like they kind of built around it right like they're trying to find play patterns within the game where you're trying to find these ways to basically create tempo and hold tempo with the cards you play with the the play patterns where you look like you know prism back-to-back turns of auras to try and like create this almost momentum and i think that is maybe even more so than tempo i'd call those decks like momentum decks um but i just wanted to, to kind of comment on that yeah so starting with everybody's favorite class particularly hayden's we're start with ranger here so ranger in general uh tends to struggle against uh i mean lexi so lexi in particular will struggle against guardian decks but azalea tends to struggle against everything your armor generally doesn't block very well um and outside of that you don't really have a weapon that can deal damage so you can get fatigued uh there is sometimes an inherent uh, fail rate with the deck when you don't draw arrows because there is a balance between your arrow attacks and your non-attacks and sometimes it's not a, you get all non-attacks so you can't do anything on that turn anyway diving into azalea here my definition for azalea is like this is the jimmy deck um so if you like to try to make something work that's fundamentally underpowered azalea is probably for you um you're going to be utilizing your arsenal to cast arrows manipulate the talk of your deck for big payoffs with things like deck dealer uh your armor doesn't block well like we said but you're, you have extra defense reactions theoretically in the form of traps they just end up not being that good uh azalea is the it's kind of the pet deck of flesh and blood i've, I've met more players that only play azalea than any other class yeah maybe i feel like i feel like bolton is like pretty up there these days as well and livia livia has gained a lot of traction yeah, so I mean Azalea, I guess it's kind of a mid-range deck. It does have it does have disruption aspects and things like fatigue shot, um, and obviously like hamstring shot, making your opponent pay extra resources. But you also have the version where you can go with the red line, uh, the red line weapon. You're aggressive and you also playing some of these disruptive cards, but it's not really your core game plan. Mostly trying to aggro out your opponent. Um, and then you're theoretically strong against uh a lot of like you're theoretically strong gets a lot of decks because of your toolbox cards like fatigue shock looks pretty good against starva sleep dart looks pretty good against chain but unfortunately you generally just end up kind of being unfavored against everything at least that's been the history of the deck so far yeah, i mean if you want to talk about ranger as a class and i guess choosing a hero in flesh and blood azalea in particular is definitely i think it's not even a debate is the weaker of the two rangers just because there's redundancy in the way that the the heroes work uh lexi has like pure upgrades on that that has access to voltaire which is a, a very strong weapon um so i think there is there's kind of that aspect i think there's more to talk about when it comes to lexi but i just i guess what i'll say with azalea is if you want to choose azalea and flesh and blood i think what you're looking to do is you're looking to do something that other people aren't doing in events you're going to at your armories etc you're looking to do really funky kind of like 
combo setups. Uh, I mean, to be honest, you can do a lot of different things. So you can purely be aggressive with on hit effects. Ridden Ledger is a very powerful card. You can build around that. But the other thing you can look to be doing is doing these really like kind of funky in game things with, you know, like rapid fire or the boots and try shot and all these kind of combo based aspects. And, and that can be kind of your prerogative, right? Of trying to find out how to break that and how to make that work in your given meta. And I think that is, that's a, that's a concept and uh, I guess a, a draw that a lot of, well, not a lot of people, but at least some people are looking for. And I think that's probably, if you are looking at Azalea, that's what you're going for. It's not going to be the most competitive hero. It's, uh, I think it's hard to, there's not a lot of play space and design space to work within apart from that kind of combo aspect because you have the bow and you have arrows and you need to play those. Mm -hmm. So next up is the modern day ranger, which is Lexi. So Lexi is particularly interesting because I feel like Lexi has three definitive archetypes that are all competitive, right? I think there is a premier aggressive deck, a premier control deck, and a premier tempo deck kind of right so you're just splashing a bit of this ice um so i could kind of do it all and i feel like lexi you know we've seen we've seen actually a lot of versions be competitive i remember lightning lexi was out pretty early in tales of aria and then more recently we've seen a lot of ice lexi to combat the rune blades but um you know michael hamilton specifically at a recent ohio 10,000 or sorry 10k i don't know 10,000k 10k was playing a fuse with lexi so there's a lot of ways to play the hero uh you know utilizing that double arsenal slot very powerful weapons and what's sort of your your view of lexi yeah, I, I see it. I don't really see a control build of Lexi personally. I see the kind of really heavy ice build as as literally this kind of momentum deck. And uh, I, I would call it like a, if you're familiar with magic, like a hate bears deck. Like it is a deck that preys on decks for skimping on resources, for trying to play five card hands. That is what I see as this kind of more controlling Lexi. And I would call it like a, a hate deck effectively. I wouldn't actually call it a control deck personally. So I think there's that. I think there's aggressive decks. And I think there's... Um, a kind of hybrid of those things where I want to I want to prey on my opponent and I want to have some ability to really take advantage of you know them trying to do five cut hands need high resources and that's kind of like I think those fuseless lists that like splash um, splash the ice I think those are kind of the decks that do that and then you have this like purely aggressive sort of build and shell which is like lightning deck like a super aggressive and I think uh, if you're I guess if I think fundamentals of like why you might want to choose that in flesh and blood I think Lexi is a great hero to choose if you are fundamentally an aggro player or an aggro tempo player that likes the ability to interact with the opponent and sort of cause them some issues, right? Make them interact with you. I think that is what Lexi is great at and that's why it's a big appeal and a big draw to some people because of the fact that either you play Lightning or Ice, you fuse it, your arrows have on-hit effects and it makes your opponent have to make decisions and uh, interact with you and you get to play in that space from super aggressive to a little bit slower and a little bit more taxing, uh, a taxing sort of hate style deck um, and i think that's what the draw is uh, plus this ability to just do really cool things really explosive turns really big turns with three of a kind and, and things like that i think is the the big draw and appeal for something like lexi and i think from a competitive standpoint being a hate deck lexi sort of always has the potential opportunity to take the meta by storm right yeah you know it, especially if something degenerate is going on particularly when it's something degenerate regarding aggro decks like linear aggressive decks lexi can really come and surprise uh, surprise a lot of people that being said if you're like picking your hero in flesh and blood lexi's going to give you a lot of options of different styles of play like you can play the aggressive deck you can play the heavy ice deck where you can play somewhere in between and all are pretty viable and relatively powerful you are going to struggle against some things like illusionist and guardian occasionally but i remember we saw lexi back in the starvo meta not to as much success but it does have those it has access to those toolbox ranger cards like fatigue shot um so you know maybe load it up on six or nine of those and if next thing you know star wars abilities were coming in for half you know there's there's an opportunity there and i think that you know ice got a few more cards here in the recent set of uprising that we're going to see a lot of lexi moving forward especially as we have some of these uh these decks that have been powerful over the past few months and even year start to actually living legend out the the opportunity for lexi only grows yeah and you get to you get to play in I, best, I think basically every space as an aggressive deck. So you can play this purely super aggressive deck that doesn't care about taxing. Or you know what? Hey, the meta is really ripe for hate and taxing. Well, I, I played the ice build. Or, I, you know, there's maybe this is just this like snapshot death dealer deck that you just kind of go ham with. Like we've seen people try and play that in the past. It's like lightning deck. So um, it's super interesting. I want to, I, you know, I've, I want to try and give a bit of spice to, to everyone. So I guess the, the last thing I would add is like Arctic Incarceration is a really interesting card. Uh, in all three colors, I think, and I'm interested to see how that card kind of impacts the um, the game moving forward. 
Yeah. And while while Azalea does have access to the to the to the legendary hood, Azalea or sorry, Lexi is going to be the one that is playing with two arsenals. So you get two arsenal slots. Um, the one that's gonna be using it. <laughs> so on to my favorite class, Hayden, which is Warrior. Warrior, the uh the OG sort of bully of flesh and blood thank god it has fallen so far from its throne but warrior the reasons why warrior has struggled is that i think in the as the game has started to uh, get more of a card pool is because a lot of decks uh not a lot of decks but particularly like rune blood decks seem like they have gotten like a linear increase in power level set by set where when it comes to things like warrior it feels like you've gotten more ways to play the game um, rather than just increasing the the power the raw power level of your current strategy and i think because of that it hasn't scaled quite as well on top of that you generally have trouble into prism if you're playing dorinthia so we can go ahead and start with dorinthia here this was one of the best decks in Welcome to Wraith. So Alpha uh, and persisted all the way up until Crucible of War. Uh, saw a lot of play, and I think if you're if you're picking Dorinthia and if you want to play Dorinthia, a lot of times you're you're going to be presenting your opponent with just tough equations, right? They've got to figure it out. You've got a lot of attack reactions. You've got on hit triggers, and your opponent is going to have to do a lot of the mental work. At the same time, the deck can be very rewarding, especially on the pitch stacking aspect, setting up things like time snap potions, have these huge turns with things like Steel Blade Supremacy or Glint the Quicksilver plus Twinning Blade. Um, it was actually one of my favorite decks back in, not necessarily class constructed, and Alpha, I thought it was pretty fun, but in the Blitz format, there was like a very pure version of Tall Warrior that I thought was particularly interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking for uh, a hero that really bases their game plan around their weapon like entirely you you know the thing you love about flesh and blood from what you've seen so far is like weapon play then i mean warrior is going to be the class for you i think in terms of just it's so both both heroes revolve around that so much but dorinthia especially and i think one of the, the really cool things about dorinthia is with the you know glistening steel blade and some of these new cards that have come about um you have like you say it's actually differentiating game plans i remember we wouldn't have said this before like crucible would say ah it just gets more of the same right like mm. two-handed weapons didn't seem viable and now it does, and, and plus different ways to play the game. The the other thing I want to say about Dorinthia as well is I think there's even more unexplored territory to go in terms of this kind of way to play Dorinthia. It is it is an aggressive deck generally. It can play somewhat towards more of a mid-range where it can sort of play off like two or three card hands okay, three card hands mostly. Um, but this, you know, <laughs> there's a card, Brendan, that I love, and I'm sure you know exactly what card I'm talking about, mm. uh, that I think we haven't seen... <laughs> unified decree is a card we haven't seen explored much in in Durantir. and i think this idea of like really heavy attack reactions is something we haven't seen in a while and i think that's a, another potential way to play Durantir. that you know rather than i guess this um uh, go wide or go tall necessarily you actually play at instant speed and, and take advantage of the fact that people are reducing their amount of defense reactions that they're playing yeah and i think from a competitive perspective um in lieu of recent living legends and prism on the chopping block like prism is very close to being living legend i think the Renthia might make a comeback you know we've seen a lot of these very powerful rune blades start to maybe come out of the format we saw starvo come out and you know prism was really the, i think that was the deck that was policing Dorinthia. um prism coming out we could see Dorinthia come back into the competitive meta hey now i'm gonna let you lead this one off because apparently it's your favorite hero but talk to about bolton i do really like bolton a lot uh i think we've seen bolton be perceived as the combo deck traditionally you know it's a sabers based combo deck and that's what we've seen uh, people have the most success with so it makes sense right especially roads national season one and i think even proquest season one uh, around luminar ascension and um and the sabers combo it's pretty, you know, you said it's pretty uninteractive, right? It's uh, it's about setting up a, a game state with your soul, finding the combo pieces that you have, and then going off with it. Like, that is kind of what the, the combo generally does. You're looking at, like, upwards of 30 damage, depending on what, what sort of combination of cards you have. And I think if you are someone who likes to play aggressive decks with a combo twist to it like bolton is going to be a hero that you really look towards but the cool thing i really like about bolton and, and I, I wish it was i do have some reservations because i think the mechanic the game design of soul when mm -hmm. it comes to bolton just doesn't quite work it's just like the, it's actually card disadvantage which is really difficult in this game to you know we talked about not having card advantage well you have a hero here that actually has card disadvantage so it's it's really displeasing um but i do think you know raiden is a very strong weapon it's a zero cost weapon it can it's always procced by the those natural play lines um 
as well as I think, you know, you do have this kind of, you can play a two-handed, a, a Bolt and Sabres or even maybe an Axis deck that doesn't combo. It just looks to just have raw power and really strong turns with some of the new cards that you have out there. And maybe the soul isn't the be-all and end-all of how to play Bolt. And maybe you take advantage of that for some of your really powerful cards like um, Celestial Cataclysm and, uh, you know, I think about cards like Veer the Vanguard and these sorts of things. But otherwise, maybe it's just a, a tool that you can utilize when necessary to give go again, uh, but you don't actually build around it. That's the thing I'm most interested about Bolt and moving forward because I think to try and build this pure Raiden-based deck around your soul is is, is card disadvantage. So it's, it's really tough to get away with. On the competitive side, uh, Bolton Combo is good when it's faster than the meta's premier aggro decks. And when it can have a secondary strategy to beat other meta decks like Prism and Guardian. Prism might not be an issue moving forward, but maybe Jermai presents the same problems. Um, when it can do that, we do see it have success. So we saw it have a reasonable amount of success back in the Monarch um, class constructed season. And since then, it's seen sort of niche uh niche results in this since then but there are some players that really stick to to that bolton uh that bolton hero and um continue to put up results with uh with the deck so um regardless of what we say we we are pretty we probably, well i'm pretty infamous for hating on bolton specifically the combo deck it is it is a good deck when when that combo is faster than the fastest deck if you're playing that combo and you're still slower then probably not where you want to be but i could see bolton come back into the format and that it is a fundamentally powerful thing that you're doing when you are you know double meaning or triple meaning and just like kind of otking your opponent so it's <laughs> something you always to keep a lookout for it's, it's an it's an aggro deck that has access to a combo and also has access to some really cool setup and good five gut hands if that's the thing you're looking for bolton's probably going to be in your warehouse yeah so now we're going to move on to the guardians so guardians have traditionally been seen as like the control decks of flesh and blood uh back in alpha there was obviously the bravo deck which was sort of an amalgamation back then because everybody just had mid-range decks um but then you know we have old him get old him gets printed with this incredible hero ability and this ridiculous armor suite to back it up uh but generally seen as the fatigue and the control decks of choice that being said i mean guardian is based around big attacks right so big attacks disruption your you're forcing your opponent to interact with that you you're taking away their uh, their ability to go again you're ripping cards from hand etc etc guardian decks tend to be the decks that see pummel played the most as well um just a little kind of anecdote there uh so first heading in is bravo so hey i know you like this deck a lot back in the day and it's it's seen it's seen consistent success not not it hasn't been the best deck i think in quite a while but I think we, we always see we always see OG Bravo putting up putting up results. Maybe not top eights, but top thirty twos, top sixteens, and metas where you think it would have would not even have the the sort of uh, like base success in. A, we've seen it put up results, so I think it's just super super powerful. Um, the big attacks with on end effects. So this is you have that you know, your specialization with crippling crush. You you're able to search up um, cards as well, tutor them up, and then yeah, your opponent if your opponent's playing an aggressive deck. So I think we saw this played a lot into chain back in the day they have to do like they can't just not block right so you don't necessarily have to be faster than the fastest aggro deck right if you're hitting them with crippling crushes you're spinal crushing them etc etc their decks can basically not function when they get hit by those hit triggers yeah i think if you're looking for a deck for speed guardian isn't the deck for you although it can be like it can be quick it can put out damage it's not it's not the be all and end all of what guardian is trying to do like you say instead it's about it's about um trading i guess on hit effects for damage and finding points in the game to push that and bravo is really cool because of the the dominate ability right like mm -hmm. you can always kind of craft this game state where you can potentially push through damage to have an on hit effect hit but it is it's about it's about heavy hitters it's about big attacks it's about uh having a really strong i guess defensive suite as well you know obviously a lot of good defense reactions the equipment and then a weapon or a range of weapons that you can kind of rely on depending on the hero you're looking at to to basically leverage that and i think if you are looking for a deck that can be more control orientated in general, but also have this ability to play out like really big attacks and, and heavy hitters, um, you know, if you, I think about like big green decks and Magic the Gathering and stuff like that, like this is the kind of deck that like I think people should be should be generally looking towards. And one of the, the cool things I think about, you know, again, just trying to add some spice in about things that I've thought about with Guardian in the past and Bravo in particular I think one of the things that's really underexplored with Guardian is the auras. Like, they just haven't been looked at. You know, we know how powerful auras and, and I guess, uh, transient abilities on the field are. And the, there's a lot of them available to you in Guardian and a lot of things that can do, 
you know powerful things uh titan um i was towering titan is uh you know you know can you set that up for just this huge turn that pushes an on hit effect that has dominate the opponent literally like well okay i have to block with one card but then i have no turn next turn for whatever reason you know like you push damage and you get the on hit effect or you know you're drawing cards with a bolden and stuff like this so um there's a lot of design space and exploration that can be used in the guardian space as well uh, as well as it just kind of defaulting to this more defensive oriented deck that can kind of push through damage yeah so bravo and this of course is by default ultimate as well has has uh, struggled with the ability to go wide and not having a lot of class cards that enable them to do that but with recent additions mm -hmm. like zealous belting and rousey agents they've definitely helped this you obviously have, have time skippers as well as a result of this your sort of boogeyman if you're playing guardian is generally illusionist and particularly prism um, guardian has really struggled into that matchup basically since its inception with prism you know maybe going towards a uh, towards living legend here uh i think after the pro tour then maybe i think i wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot more bravo come out um because it's prism is the, is the main thing that punishes people trying to bring that deck right now so yeah heading on to old him here old him is an incredible hero in flesh and blood like genuinely an incredible hero just read that hero ability let it sink in and then read it again because that is ridiculous it's like a drone of brutality on your hero a lot of people listening to this are like what is drone of brutality well it was this card back in alpha that used to be busted <laughs> that recycled itself in the, the deck and blocked for two uh, but yeah ultim is generally a defensive deck uh, but overall can grind out a lot of value via that hero ability so it can ice react to put cards on the opponent's card on top of their deck or it can earth react to prevent two um it is the premier fatigue deck so when we talk about fatigue most of the time it's being done with old him um and as is true with guardian so with bravo but particularly true in old him in extremely good equipment like unrivaled good equipment we have crown of seeds oh, we have eisenloft we have the fridge like the armor on this hero is incredible yeah old him is like in my eyes is like the premier like if you are wanting to come into this game you want to be a control player there is no other choice for you than ultim i think in terms of if you want a purist kind of deck where you have to make decisions about what how you're trying to eke out advantage across the game with cards like crown of seeds with the hero ability where do i want to earth react do i want to ice react do i not want to react like this there's, there's these really cool kind of defensive decisions that come into play with ultim so while i think bravo can really focus more on these kind of like um patches of the game where you're trying to set up really important on hit effects and push through with dominate on the flip side ultim has these heavy hitters but often they're more about uh you know the end game or it's the fact that it's like a byproduct to play an aggressive plan into maybe your bad matchups but a lot of the time they're just defending so you know i think ultim in its purest form is a, is a control deck but you can play it differently like you say uh, rouse the ancients um i was gonna say ravenous rebel not Pummels. ravenous rebel the one yeah, so we have that you're talking about zealous belting, but you know you've got pommels in that deck as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So competitively, I think that old him is just a fundamentally very powerful deck. Uh, but on top of that, I think it's one of the great mediators in flesh and blood, and plays a large factor in shaping the competitive meta each season. It's always there, and it's usually being played. So you have to develop game plans to sort of prepare for that um cannot be ignored it does suffer from the same downsides as bravo where you're a illusionist matchup and it is actually worse than bravo it's pretty bad um especially if you're playing a more control or defensive deck there's almost no hope against that prism aura build um but yeah prism's heading out so <laughs> might be might be guardian time what's right. cool is i'm like scrolling down our notes just before you you run into uh room blade here every class has two heroes in class constructed right now apart from mechanologist that's really cool sorry i just want to point that out <laughs> i actually yeah i i didn't uh what, what would you say i that? never clicked yeah i didn't know I that con yeah i didn't consciously know that actually so onto runeblade which has actually had a lot of heroes usually but not anymore because we had chain living legend out runeblade uh the upside of runeblade is that yeah, I mean, you've just been blessed by LSS if you play Runeblade. It's um, a lot of value, has had some very, very, very powerful text on those heroes, um, and has benefited from getting most a lot upgrades from pretty much every set that it was able to. Um, so 
The good thing, the downside of RuneBlade is sometimes it can be subject, uh, it can struggle against fatigue, right? So this actually happened, a lot of people know this, but back in Arcane Rising and Crucible, Visrai would actually get would actually fatigue um, back then. And that might actually happen again now because Bloodsheath Scalata and your Sonata combo, the, what you would use to beat decks that were trying to fatigue you, has been banned. Um, that being said, there's... A lot more powerful cards have been added to the game since Arcane Rising, so probably not as much of an issue, but it is something to consider with these Rune Blades. You do have a deck building constraint, and this is my quote unquote constraint that you get paid off for if you satisfy, which is you you want to have a good split between non-attack actions and attack actions. A lot of Rune Blade abilities and cards will sort of have that prerequisite on them. So starting off with Briar. So Briar, my uh, my phrase for Briar is embodiments and erratas. <laughs> so Brata, uh, Briar has been errated from its original design. It used to generate, um, I guess, infinite amount of embodiments of Earth for every time you would hit um, during your turn, and then it would generate one lightning for the first when you play two non-attack actions. And since now it only generates one embodiment of Earth, no matter how many times you hit that turn. It is much more balanced now, but as a result, it is not as strong as it used to be. That the deck, the Briar deck that really abused that was the Chira Briar deck that was created by Tarek Patel and Co. back in US Nationals. And basically, it was pretty much the fastest aggro deck, but at the same time, it could use one card from hand to block for like seven if you decided to take the damage and try to pivot on them. So, very powerful, very powerful back then. Nowadays, we see more of a reliance on channel mount heroic. So you're not able to generate all those embodiments of earths um, and you've had things like plunder run and ball lightning ban. So I would say most of Briar nowadays is actually centered around CMH, so channel mount heroic. And my main issue with the class is I feel like it feels a bit high variance for the games where I don't draw Channel Mount Heroic quickly and I don't draw them often, right? The The card is so fundamentally powerful and so important to your game plan. Um, and like that's just what Briar's about nowadays is Channel Mount Heroic. I, I think the deck is better than... I, 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 I did think sort of post-ban and I looked at... Obviously, we had a Briar in top eight at the Pro Tour and it continues to just really plug away and it's like this now it's like this consistent player where mm -hmm. it's doing well throughout the seasons um i think i was trying to think about the identity of it the other day and because if i think about runeblade overall i think you're attracted to runeblade if you really like this idea of like split damage if you like the idea of attacking on two axes like that is it's very unique only runeblade can really do it right so it is it is that wheelhouse of runeblade and i also think that's why it's been brought success right like in terms of it is it is hard to deal with it is a great sort of design playground to be in in terms of deck building and things like that because you know you get this balance of attack actions and non-attack actions like you say i think for briar in like a big way um the the draw of channel mount is obviously huge like you say it is a very powerful card as a cornerstone of the deck but i do think that a lot of there's a lot of actual different ways to build briar um outside of that as well i think maybe you are always going to start with this kind of earth core now because of the deck but Maybe you go in a different direction. Maybe you go like try and be like Cheerios base, like you say, and you play the Channel Mount Heroic package, but then everything else is like super efficient attacks. Maybe you can go a bit taller again. You can revisit cards like Stir the Wildwood and and things like that. So I do Briar, it does interest me from that perspective. And I think as like sort of these one or two cards from each set that get printed that could have an impact could actually drastically change the way that you could build Briar. So I'm really excited to see what those what that looks like. <clears throat> yeah, I would say Briar generally has a lot of go again at long combat chains and not too many hit triggers. There is a different style playing it where you do go more tall. Um, from a competitive perspective, Briar is just kind of a staple in the format. Um, it's consistent. It has continued to be consistent after bans. Shows up in top eights pretty much everywhere. Um, and I know immediately when Uprising was kind of released, Briar was the go-to aggro deck i guess we'll see if that switches over to its runeblade counterpart but briar is just a good pick if you want a powerful a powerful heal that's going to play in an aggressive form so next up uh, hayden is one of my favorite heroes and i'm sure one of yours as well because it your won favorite you, heroes yes won say. you a national championship um this is viscerai this is the original runeblade um awesome awesome class I, it, so briar the the dual damage or the the you know arc the mix of arcane damage and physical damage feels more of just like a uh, maybe afterthought is too much of a powerful a word, but it, yeah, it's not it's not core to the identity. Viscerai is the complete opposite. Viscerai is all about split damage. It's all about you know presenting a, quite a bit of arcane damage while having these 
very, very well, well costed uh, attacks, you know, things like Shrill of Skull Form. I would say nowadays the deck looks a lot like Mauvern Skies plus Attack plus Rosetta Thorn. Just a great, uh, kind of a great value deck, generally an aggro deck. It used to have a combo aspect to it um, via Blood Sheet Scalata and Sonata. Nowadays that is gone. Um, but basically all that means for you as a Viscerai player is that you fundamentally you're less powerful in every matchup. That the, that combo was your tool to sort of cheese your way through fatigue or control. It was it was a very easy matchup for you with that. Um, but it was also good against the other aggro decks because you could basically just do a little mini combo on like turn two or three and just get like you know nine to nineteen damage kind of out of nowhere. Um, so has has definitely dropped in power. But I know Hayden, you probably have some more to say that you think it's still up there with tier one, eh? I just run, I just took out a road to nationals on Sunday with it. So I, I mean, I do think Viserai is still very powerful. The, the the cool, like you say, it is through and through. It is the split damage. It is the rune chant based deck, right? In terms of its damage is really looking to come from both, and that's why you talked about fatigue previously, right? The reason that you can fatigue these kind of decks is because you don't lose cards to prevent arcane damage, right? Picture blue, mm -hmm. you can prevent split damage pretty easily, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I do also think Viserai is like the best Rosetta Thorn deck, to be honest. I think. Yeah. It just utilizes it so well because of the natural play patterns of like uh, Moverin Skies into attack action that cost two into attack the Rosetta Thorn. Uh, it also utilizes Creepers so, so friggin' well. Like that's, you know, that's Viscerized Seeds of Agony. And, uh, sorry, Seeds of Agony. Crown of Seeds in my eyes, right? Like it is almost that power level in Viscerai. Maybe not quite. Um, the the other thing as well is I think with the banning of Scalata, uh, yes, it does take away some of the power level. It really opens up the design space of Viscerai, which I think is super cool, right? So I personally played like a belittle base deck on the weekend. I think with you know Sc no Scalata, that kind of opens up that kind of play space. I, I do think actually, interestingly, Viscerai has pretty limited scope of design space. So I think if you are looking to play a hero like Viscerai, you are kind of pretty priced into pretty specific um, gameplay patterns, which is like this idea of, you know, an attack action and non-attack action on a turn and maybe something into like weapon and you are really trying to like either play like a tempo or a pure aggressive strategy trying to play defensive with this deck is really difficult because you don't have the payoffs like you just said right you don't have scalata anymore but you can still do these kind of com almost like half setup combos with mordra tide you can stack up you know eight to 12 rune chance and sort of go off for like a, a 35 damage turn like that is not out of the question but it is a lot harder uh, than it used to be and i think the deck can look kind of different so i do think you can play in the space a little bit but your design space is very in the middle it's like slightly aggressive or maybe slightly set up and that's kind of where you have to play now yeah, although the cards are not used very often nowadays, Viscera does have um, access to disruptive cards like Consuming Volition, Reek Corruption, I think it is, mm -hmm. um, and a few others as well. And on hit, on hit triggers, kind of yeah, just mean in great. general. Has on hit effects, yep. right? Has yeah. on hit effects. Arc Knight Ascendancy. Yep. Um, that, we do see less of those played these days, but they're always kind of you know, ready to come out of the woodwork there and be popular again. I think if you're looking yeah, for... Point. If you're looking for a... <sighs> Just a premier aggressive deck that is just placed very high value kind of kind of turns. Um, it does have the ability to block, right? It does have the fridge. It is a fantastic weapon. I think Viscerai is a great class for you. I'm interested to see where the hero goes if Briar gets banned, um, and yeah. with Briar goes Rosetta Thorn as well. So that could be that could be interesting for Viscerai. But overall. Pretty much my favorite hero in Flesh and Blood. I think. I mean, Kano's Kano's in a different class, but uh, yeah, I love Viscerai. I did love it a bit more when it had the combo <laughs> available, but you know, it's still got, a, it's, it's still got, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Like, I think if you're, if you like interesting proactive decks because of sequencing, like sequencing is really interesting to you. This is the right for you. So next up we have Mechanologist. So Mechanologist, when we're talking about Mechanologist, we're only talking about Dash. I would say the, the sort of the, the, what you can do with Mechanologist, you can't do with any other classes. Mostly persistent board states around items. Prism can do this as well with auras, but you know, Mechanologist gets to start with an item in play, can tutor for items via Spark of Genius, um, and can develop these board states to actually just overwhelm the opponent in the late game. The downsides is Mech tends to struggle against like very fast aggro decks. Um, so this is <laughs> in in recent memory, this has been the Runeblade decks that have dominated most of our competitive metas uh, up until now. So Mech has struggled a bit with that. It was a very dominant force back in Crucible of War, like it was kind of the deck to beat. Um, but since then, it has fallen a bit. We we talk about the items there, but there's another way to play Dash as well, which is full on aggressive boost. So basically, you are playing 
pretty much all mechanologist cards in your deck you're boosting and banishing and just banishing mech cards and just getting go again on everything and you are like i mean with teclo pounder um this 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 strategy is seems much a bit more viable than it was before um but at the same time like that strategy will always generally will always struggle into fatigue because you deck yourself pretty fast yeah, I, I mean, you can also play in that in between, right? So you have this kind of aggro deck that can also set up board states, persistent board states with items, like you say. Dash is, is very interesting. I think you can do, it is probably the one that has the widest spread of easy, accessible ways to build and play it from a super hyper-aggressive deck. I think about Tickler Pounder. I think about, you know, the fact that literally you use your deck as a resource to have Inherent Go again. You uh, have cards like Maximum Velocity with really high payoff for these wide aggressive turns. And then you have this like ability to be like, I'm just going to sit behind items and play defense reactions and, and be super defensive. And then you can play in the mid, which we talked about. So I think if you're looking for something that has a lot of flexibility, you really like the the thought of maybe changing between game plans, uh, then this this is like Dash is potentially the hero for you. I'm really interested to see where we go next with Mechanologist. I think the obvious place to go as a new mechanologist hero that is what we're all kind of looking for and what that might look like i think some of the items that are kind of underexplored is like cognition nodes like what could you do with that is this the is there a deck you can build which is like it's anti-fatigue deck that kind of never decks out because of cognition nodes or maybe you even are the fatigue what about conviction amplifier you know this dominate on tap like where can we go with some of the other underexplored items and what could they look like gosh sorry you just you just i uh, actually met an older gentleman in New York that was uh, pretty confident that his cognition node mechanologist deck was just the next big thing in flesh and blood. I just forgot about <laughs> I that. I saw it as it hit <laughs> you there. Um, that's, <laughs> shout out to Luke Badger. Um, so next up is Illusionist. Illusionist is, I actually really appreciate Illusionist and flesh and blood. Originally, I didn't like it, um, but it does something very important for this game, which is it keeps the guardians in check because those things are. I mean, old him is just. I don't know. It's it Prism scares does, me. Yeah. yeah, Prism does. We'll we'll have to see about your mind. So the the upsides of I mean, what you're getting when you're playing Illusionist and the upsides of that is you you develop persistent board states, but it's not via items like that. It's via auras, which can be played at instant speed, um, and the zero cost auras as well, which can be either played from hand or you know if you get a uh, coalescence mirage broken, you can play it for free, which just sounds busted to me. Uh, the downsides is like the these prism decks um, in particular, and I'm assuming Jermai probably follow the same vein, tend to struggle, have struggled in the past against like very aggressive runeblade decks, but at the same time, and almost paradoxically, they've been they've been built to actually target those decks. So we've seen Fatigue Prism see a lot of success. Um, it was seeing success at the Pro Tour. It won the Calling Vegas back in uh back in Monarch, or yeah, back at the release of Tales, but in Monarch. The class itself is very fun to play. I think if you like if you like wizard, but you don't want to go all the way down that rabbit hole of just playing this, you know, this ridiculous class that's either the greatest class in the world or the worst. Like Prism is a nice happy medium where you can play it, you can play it instant speed, but at the same time you can default to these under costed uh, big attacks via heralds or via centipies from Jermai and aggro out your opponent. There's actually the two main archetypes in Prism specifically are aggro herald and aura prism. There's an amalgamation that plays both, but generally it's going to be some mix of of those two archetypes. So it's the same, Brendan. I said to actually quickly, it changed. Uh, no, the the power went out of my house yesterday, so me and Brendan had to split the recording of the pod in two. I apologize, Brendan, but illusionist. I was talking about Prism and saying that I think Prism. If you if you want to play a deck that kind of cares about understanding the game state and when you need to switch gears, I think Prism is kind of that deck, right? You know, when when is the time to start trying to place auras on the board versus when is it time to try and push damage? There's like a real delicate balance, I think, between that for Illusionist, but Prism in particular, and I think that's quite a, a cool sort of, it's like a cool sort of design, I think. And you were saying at the start with Illusionist, you know, it, it's growing on you as as the game's gone. I think with the blue auras being introduced in Everfest, I completely agree. I think the, the, the deck has kind of changed in that way. And there's still more avenues to explore, I think, as well. You know, you talked about your favorite card, Coalescing Mirage. Um, you know, there's, there's those sort of phantasm cards that we haven't seen as much, and, and maybe some of them are going to go into Jeremiah, the non-light ones, but I, I guess we'll see. Yeah, and so from a competitive standpoint, bringing Prism um, and potentially bringing Illusionist, I haven't, we haven't really flushed out Jeremiah quite yet in her her spot in the meta, but bringing Prism, you're going to... A lot of a lot of these tournaments, you're going to have some easy games, and these are going to be a bit against your Guardian decks. Guardians probably will always be showing up, um, at least for a while, uh, until there's something else that I think hates it out of the meta. I think Illusionist alone isn't enough to deter people from 
completely playing guardian so you're gonna all it's like it is a bit of a meta call but because old him is so powerful i feel like you're always going to have like some portion significant portion of the meta that's going to be quite an easy match for you the downside of that is usually the rune blades are quite hard uh, we did talk about how people have teched the deck to sort of try to beat beat that but uh yeah ultimately you are a bit sw a split and we earlier we also talked about old him being a uh, kind of keeping the format healthy or like just just determining the format and policing it a bit uh prism does that as well but for these guardian decks like the probably the main reason in flesh and blood that guardian decks are not completely rampant and when i say guardian i mostly mean old him um is because of things like like prism really really hard matchup for for old him yep yeah yeah it, it definitely can be and it, it really is kind of a, a big discrepancy against prism hands where you double aura to start the game versus where you you don't as well so it's quite an interesting kind of deck to play and you've got to learn to navigate i think after that and those kind of those kind of play patterns and decks are something that you might find in other games especially with permanents and the the cool thing I, well the interesting thing at least about flesh and blood is those permanents you know they can be hit fairly easily so you have to try and understand when is the right time to you know like bookend those when is it the right time to uh try and push some push some tempo using your life to then try and assert some table presence so that you can then kind of use that for the rest of the game mm -hmm. and yeah to close out here just want to re-mention that it is likely that prism will living legend shortly after pro tour 2 just from this road to national season and maybe it'll get uh a good placing in the pro tour likely will living legend needs to win needs to win yeah. the pro tour yeah well, no, it's not actually, is I'm it, actually not sure. Are you sure winning it has to win the Pro Tour with its yeah, accumulation? Been... No, but accumulation via Road to Nationals as well. Oh, so, I mean, no, no, no. I'm not saying, I'm saying if it wants to get points at the Pro Tour, like nah, a I'm good placing yeah, needs, yeah. To, needs to win at the Pro Tour to get Living Legend points. But to be honest, based on the first two weeks of Road to Nationals, Prism might not Living Legend this season, which is pretty interesting. So it's going to be very close, I think. Yes, I, I don't think that Prism will win the Pro Tour. I think that it... Well, most likely, if it if it Living Legends, it will get that via Road to Nationals, and then Living Legend on the next banner restricted announcement. It's coming no matter what, because Prism does have such a powerful strategy that Nanax is just bound to put up results when it lands in the right metas. Um, even if it's like a local meta, it's like a sub meta of whatever the entire world's playing. I think the Prism is pretty much destined to get there pretty soon so let's go ahead and move on to Jeremiah Hayden. So Jeremiah is the new Illusionist out of the Draconic Illusionist out of Uprising sort of about utilizing dragons to assemble a team full of allies and overwhelm your opponent uh Jermai also does have big under cost attacks but in the form of centipies instead of heralds um but not nearly as much as prism these centipies do have that phantasm keyword so they do get popped if blocked by six power so that same sort of i guess it is a uh, universal illusionist downside to these sort of attacks um but yeah hey what are what are sort of your thoughts on Jermai since it is so new it's early days i think the 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 dragons right that's the the allure and that's the pull to this kind of deck is being able to play with allies we haven't had a class so far that gets to play with allies you know you can see it in terms of you get one in each of the shadow heroes from monarch so you get the legendary and those uh those heroes but you don't have this this hero this class that can actually have access to play a lot of allies and, and have a game plan based around it until until we get to my so I, I think that's kind of the the biggest pull is if you like to play with effectively creatures like if you're from a, a magic the gathering background or, or other games where you have these attacking sort of threats on board that yes your opponent can interact and deal with but have permanent sort of threats and again it comes into that kind of prism sort of scape i think where you're trying to build a deck that can leverage this idea of some permanency on the board to overwhelm the opponent at some point so whether that's through the aether ash wings through the tokens or whether that's through the the allied dragons themselves at what point do you actually the invo the invocations at what point are you sort of trying to turn a corner in a mess or are you just playing like there could be this very aggressive aggro deck that's you know obviously you're incentivized to play a red line deck because of jeremiah's ability um and you know the legendary do you build this sort of like super red line aggro deck cards like sweeping blow um you know th things like this that can get involved uh with that deck and, and push it forward or do you look down sort of down the line to uh, a more defensive deck and i honestly think that's where dromai is probably going to live is either super aggressive or super defensive and you play this kind of attrition based game with the invocations and the ash wings and just kind of overwhelm your opponent through the long game and through sort of solid defenses and these little chip threats like i know you love talking about sticky weapons and although it doesn't take an action point to kill uh your ash wings it is it's theoretically you know harder to kill an ash wing than it is to kill a spectral shield right so that's quite an interesting piece about about dromai 
<clears throat> yeah, so Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a draconic illusionist, and draconic does have this sort of red line pitch matters uh, theme. So I assume that a lot of Jeremiah decks will be pretty red heavy as a result. Uh, the allies, like you said, the allies are similar to auras, but different in the sense that they don't have that spectra keyword, so they don't take action points. Um, but instead, they have life totals, which also means that your opponent can utilize them for on hit triggers. So things like, um, I can't remember if Masco Methem has hit a player, but just yeah, on hit triggers. No, it's, it's, it's on hit. <laughs> yeah, so anything that's like on hit like that, they can't actually trigger that off your allies, so it is a potential downside. It does look like it has a natural weakness to things like ninja. Um, so yeah, theoretically bad versus ninja and things that have on hit triggers, but I think versus guardian, while you don't have this you aren't putting down auras that are taking that guardian's action point. I think if you're landing two dragons a turn, you're still going to be putting the guardian in that same sort of tough scenario where they it is very unlikely they can clear more than one dragon per turn to be honest but definitely almost never more than two because they lack those go again attacks so it, it ends up kind of tempoing them in a similar way to the auras maybe not as powerful but i think if you're landing two dragons a turn which is probably easier to do potentially easier to do than landing two auras a turn um you're actually going to be putting that same spot where they just get templated out and they can't they can't clear the board state I think the the dragons are easier to clear than auras, right? Which is one thing to keep in mind. The, the oh, thing I that agree. attracts me the most to Jeremiah and to Guardian is Ash, Ash Wings. It's really difficult for them to clear multiple Ash Wings because you have to have a single source of an attack. So, you know, when you've got Kadachis and all these kind of go wide threats coming in at you, yeah, the Ash Wings are a lot less effective. But when your opponent maybe has two attacks, two big attacks turn, one big attack a turn, Ash Wings have a lot of value. And if they're using a full card to pop one of those Ash Wings, you know, you're in a good spot. I think you can play this kind of mid-rangey, grindy game with Ash Wings into Guardian and actually potentially fatigue them even. So it's quite an interesting dynamic. For sure. So speaking of uh, speaking of Ninja, let's go ahead and head on to Ninja. So Ninja's been with us since Welcome to Wraith uh, via Katsu. It was... There was a there was kind of a dichotomy in alpha between warrior players and ninja players. Like I, I felt like uh, I felt like Guardian and Brute existed more on the fringe. Uh brute obviously being much more so than guardian but it was really there was there was mid-range ninja players and these like mid-range warrior players um so katsu back then was a very very good deck we did ultimately see katsu take down the first construct tournament but it was a bit of a different version than everybody's used to it was actually a control version of katsu that utilized drone of brutality and a defense reaction called flick flack um katsu is kind of if you look at the design of katsu it is sort of the i don't know the idyllic aggro deck right it has on hit triggers it can tutor it has combo lines and it's it's super aggressive but because of the defense reaction flick flack and kadachi's being so good against you know old school fatigue strategies that katsu deck was actually able to uh to morph into a control deck because flick flack was able to give the deck so much value via blocking and the guardian deck could not deal with the kadachi's over a long period a long period of time and ultimately jordan vitality was also a busted card but that's a story for another day <laughs> i mean people at home playing the drinking game are thinking it's been a few episodes since brendan's talked about drone uh ninja control so Good to hear it back again on the on the show. <laughs> I, I think for me the the ninja class and it's particularly Katsu. Like the I think if you are looking for a hero that can kind of potentially do it all, like you can flex your deck really easily. Like you just talked about control variants, mid range variants. We're seeing with Flick Flack as well, plus hyper aggressive mask orientated decks, combo decks with the Lord of Wind line with the leg tap line. Like the, these are the sorts of uh, this is the I guess the class really you should be looking at, but particularly Katsu I think can kind of do all those things. Will Fly just be a pure aggro deck? I mean, it looks that way. Is Katsu best as an aggro deck? Yeah, probably because of the the combo lines that you do have and the efficiency. I mean, the most thing the thing I enjoy the most about playing a deck like Katsu is the kind of decisions you have to make about the threat density in your deck and when you go for you know your big turns, how you try and set up these like uh, these um, combat chains with with the combo cards is really interesting to me and i think that's probably what people will enjoy about about katsu and i think there's still more to be seen with katsu you know shuko coming into the format as the new legendary from uprising is super interesting for a katsu deck there's a lot of avenues you can go down i think it brings back cards like salt the wound as opportunities and uh playing a lot more low to the ground aggressive than maybe we'd seen previously and trying to leverage that sh that shuko over the course of a game especially where an opponent's forced to defend out it changes yeah. breakpoints for mask which is huge 
So Katsu becomes pretty interesting when you look at its key equipment of Masco Momentum. Um, there are arguments to maybe sometimes play a different headpiece, but Masco Momentum, ultimately, it does change uh, a lot of the gameplay dynamic, both on your end to try to get that trigger, but your opponents win and how they block. Well, if they block, you know, maybe your second attack to try to, you know, not have to block your third attack. Um, it, it's a really tough equation for the opponent to try and solve. Also, it's important to mention that Katsu's hero ability is pretty unique. <laughs> so if you're if you if you hit, you're able to pitch a zero. Well, not pitch because that's not the word for it in yeah. Flesh and Blood. But this card is zero cost and actually go and search for a card that has combo on it. So it's like inherently reducing the variance that you need in order to complete an entire combo line and your opponent when you're presenting them with just a regular damage has to be like okay does he have the the next card of this combo line already or is he going to go search it so um it's definitely tough on the opponent's side to play to play against the katsu so far competitively katsu has struggled since probably around crucible of war it was much more of a it was probably more popular I guess there wasn't there was an aggro deck. That, season one, yeah, yeah, there was an aggro deck back then that didn't see as much play as it probably should have. So we saw a bit of control still stick around, but ultimately fade away towards these from these dash decks that would outvalue it after Dread of Brutality was banned. But it has struggled since then, um, just because it hasn't been the premier aggro deck, and we've existed in a lot of metas where you're either on the ultra defensive side or you're playing the best aggro deck, right? And anything anything that's a, an, a, an aggressive deck but is somehow below the power level of whatever that premier aggro deck is, it's just like, why are you even playing the deck? So Katsu has sort of faded a bit since then. Um, it, it that has suffered from some of the things that Warrior has where up until Uprising, I think Uprising, we actually got some strict upgrades, but up until Uprising, it seems like you got a bunch of side grades and a bunch of different ways to play the, to play the hero rather than strict upgrades and a direct increase in power level. Yeah, there's a lot of things to explore with Katsu. You know, there's Flood of Force lines, there's Pouncing Link sort of builds that people haven't even really sort of dug into. So I think there's something differently there. But you talk about Premier Aggro decks, the format. What about Fi? Yeah, so Fi is the new Draconic Ninja out of Uprising and definitely looks to be one of the Premier Aggro decks. Is it the Premier Aggro deck? I'm not sure, right? Because it, it has to pass. And this, this is going to be not a very timeless statement if you're listening to this sometime in the future, but it has to pass the litmus, the litmus test of being faster than Briar. If it's not faster than Briar, it's like, what is this class actually giving me? And it needs to give you some better, sort of better game plan into fatigue if it's not as fast as Briar or some on-hit triggers that are really forcing your opponent to block and interact with it. But in terms of archetypes so far from what, what I've seen from Fi is that it's it's an aggressive deck, right? And it's all the cool part about Fi and the unique part is that it does utilize its grave it's able to start with a phoenix flame in the graveyard and return that to hand via Fi's ability at instant speed so it leads to a lot of cool sort of gameplay lines but i think overall if you're looking about like what is my Fi experience going to be like long combat chains and sort of big damage and i would i and i'm pretty sure this is correct but in the more competitive versions of Fi that i've seen not a lot of hit triggers right more just raw damage yep yep no completely true and there's a lot of different avenues you can go down and explore there's Ember, um, there's the Ember Blade builds, there's Kadachi builds, you know, Mask of Momentum is definitely very potent in those kind of decks as well. So I think we're still at a very early stage of, of Fire, but uh, if you are looking for this pure kind of go wide aggressive deck, you know, a lot of little hits, I think Fire is that deck. Fire is the most, uh, uh, sort of has the longest combat chains in the game so far. So I think that's the deck for you. Mm -hmm. All right, on to a uh, favorite of somebody's here in the podcast. This is going to be Brute, but we can just jump directly into Reinar. So Reinar been around since the beginning was very very underrated in alpha actually almost almost unplayed to be honest there was some people playing it but nobody really took it to good finishes at high level tournaments and it, it was uh you know it's talked down upon it wasn't until after after that format had come and gone that we look back and be like okay reiner was probably pretty powerful um it's reiner is particularly interesting because of the hero ability allowing you to intimidate additional cards from the opponent's hand it does have built-in evasion so theoretically it is very very good against fatigue strategies and defensive strategies that want to sit back right because you can not even let your opponent have the opportunity to interact with you so things like uh defensive cards that are a lot of value like defense reactions zero for fours or even unmovables like they can be they can be completely useless against reinar at the same time the deck is relatively aggressive right you can have huge turns with blood rush uh blood rush bellows and we have new cards out of um everfest like swing big that have added so much to the arsenal but hayden i know this is one of your your favorite heroes or if not i think it might be your favorite hero 
full stop in flesh and blood. Tell me a little bit about the Reinar experience. It definitely is. I mean, it's a it's an attrition based deck that can have combo lines. Like that is that is what Reinar can be, but it also has this ability to be an evasive deck, you know, with the, the use of intimidate. So you have this sort of hero that plays really well against the kind of defensive end of the format, plus plays, you know, particularly well into decks that kind of want to play around the, the middle of the format. Where Reinar struggles is against the aggressive part of the format. And that's what's kind of been Reinar's trouble for I guess the last year or last two years almost in flesh and blood. Um, but it is the it is probably honestly Rhino is probably one of the most unique heroes in this game. The intimidate mechanic is so unique to interact with what an opponent is doing on defense or uh, changing the ability for them to make decisions is not something that you know heroes really do. You could say like Ice React out of Ultim is kind of the one that can can kind of do something similar. But Rhino can you know take away an opponent's whole turn uh, you know whole turn of defensive sort of ability but they get those cards back. So it is something to really understand about how you want to use these hero abilities. I think where we go with like Reinar next is like Reinar is always going to be, always have the potential to be a meta player because of the hero mechanic and because of cards like Blood Rush Bellows and Alpha Rampage to be able to disrupt these super defensive decks. So, you know, if we see a, a rebalancing of a format where we go from super aggressive decks to, you know, I guess um, this idea of defensive decks that can kind of take advantage or control decks, whatever you want to call them, then Reinar can, I think, really find a spot in the meta and also it can attack a deck that generally wants to prey on those kind of decks like an Ultim, Prism. You know, it can also do well into Prism. So I think Reinar is potentially in an interesting spot for this meta. It just depends how aggressive we are. You know, we're looking at sort of a pretty belittle meta right now. So going forward, where will Reinar find its spot? But you do, if you do want to play Brute and you are interested in these kind of these big six attack mechanics, there is another hero you can play. Although I would say it's very different to Reinar. Yeah. Um, I would, in, in my opinion, I see Reinar as the quintessential mid range deck of flesh and blood. <laughs> and I think dash maybe competes with it a little bit as well, but Reinar for me defines kind of mid range in this game. Uh, competitively, like Hayden said, Reinar has struggled a bit since crucible of war in these hyper aggressive formats dominated by rune blades um it's just not really where the deck flourishes which is unfortunate because i think the deck would be very good against a lot of the other decks that are brought to sort of disrupt that meta whether it's old him decks or prism decks um rhino does fit in very well if we see all of the rune blades sort of turbo living legend themselves out of the games i think that rhino could be pretty a uh, pretty good pick um and it could even be a good pick in uprising it, it is it is a meta call deck i think to an extent so if the right meta sort of formulates rhino is an option so on to our on to our next brute which is uh this is also sort of a I don't know. This is a deck that some people some people love and they stick to, and it's it's sort of it's sort of their identity, and that's Levia. So this is the, uh, the it's a shadow the shadow brute out of Monarch, and I put uh, it's like Reinar, but it's worse. Just kidding. Um, doesn't have that intimidate mechanic. Instead, it does utilize the graveyard and the banish zone via blood debt. Um, it's hey, you talk to me a little bit more more about Levia because back in Monarch, I remember you were thinking about bringing this, I think, to a major calling because of its ability to maybe go fast against some of the rune blade decks but ultimately ended up um on chain i mean if you're looking at levia the the good thing about levia and what it kind of does is it has this ability to i guess trade up on cards right so you get to you get to use your graveyard in the banner zone for recycling cards so you have this kind of chain-esque ability to loop cards you know play extra cards from hand um, but actually, even more so, you can actually loop cards, right? But also, your your cards just have great return rates. So where decks are attacking into you, and you can defend with you know a couple of cards, you can play really well off two to three cards. You know, you're looking at one for sixes. You're looking at three for nine. You know, you're looking at really big damage thresholds uh, with with Levia, plus this ability to to play Carrying Husk, which is to be honest, just one of the best equipment in the game. So you, I think that's the kind of the draw of Levia. The the reason that I thought it was good in previous formats is for these reasons. You know, where we had aggressive to mid-range base formats i think livia traditionally i think and people might have different opinions but my view of livia is that it's struggled more into control decks but i do think that one interesting thing about livia is you can kind of build it in so many different ways you can literally play a livia deck that's just a reinar deck reskinned as well you know you don't have to play this kind of um graveyard banish zone base sort of thing with livia so you have a lot of different avenues to attack the format and kind of build your deck and i think just Livia being a talented brute gives you more options to do that. You have just generally more access to cards, which is, is super cool. So I think if you're a brute player, you have like so many different types of decks you can play between Reinar and Livia, which is really interesting. And Livia in particular kind of, I think, accentuates that even more. So that's why I think we see such like a passionate following for Livia because there's so many different things you can do with that hero. So I'm, I'm not surprised that we can see that sort of continue to grow, the sort of Livia mains. 
Yeah, so from a competitive standpoint, I would say that Levia struggles against most decks, but it's more powerful than people assume, and it can really put out it can put out a lot of raw damage. Uh, just struggling a bit for play. yeah, and struggling a bit for on hit effects and forcing the opponent to interact. Um, but ultimately, we'll see if I'm interested to see if Levia kind of comes out because I do see the Levia builds that I have seen see any success have actually not really utilized the shadow cards or like the blood yeah. deck cards they've actually just kind of been different reinar decks um so interested to see if levia is able to compete if reinar is also viable so on to i think this is our last class in flesh and blood and that's wizard and we can't talk about wizard without talking wizard without talking about my favorite hero which is kano and it's not even particularly close to be honest so Kano is the gentleman's hero of flesh and blood. It is usually usually a tempo deck, but re as recently we saw, it's also a combo deck now with the introduction of Aether Wildfire. Kano plays flesh and blood on a completely different axis than any other hero class experience possible in flesh and blood. You can get sort of versions of that via Illusionist and I probably through Icelander now as well. But Kano is, it's weird, right? It's different. It only use, utilizes arcane damage. You can play it into speed. It's hero ability effectively says pay three, draw a card. Not this, not exactly that, but it's a version of it. Um, and it can combo, right? Like it can, it can combo and do 50 damage, 100 damage on one turn. And that's not even unusual, particularly if your opponents don't have Arcane Barrier. Hitting a 100 damage turn, if you went and played 20 games, I wouldn't even think it's that unreasonable you would hit that once in, in 20 games. Like it's reasonably possible to do that with this card called Aether Wildfire. In terms of playing the deck it's it's quite challenging to be honest like this is one of those decks where you're going to start playing it and you're going to be like this is the biggest pile of unusable unplayable garbage i've ever seen in my life and there is a journey of enlightenment that you will have to go on before you see the light on kano and see the potential power level you, everybody everybody can pick up kano for the first time go on that struggle and then get a few of those games right get a few of those ones where you just burn your opponent out you draw the right cards, and you're like oh, okay i see this i see the potential but there is a very very low variance way of playing kano and consistent way of playing that deck that takes a lot of practice but i think that is the most rewarding play experience that you can go on in flesh and blood is starting on wizard and particularly kano losing a lot and then finally turning the corner and sort of gaining some agency and some control in some of these games hayden also played kano at the pro tour um what are, what are your thoughts on, on this uh, on this particular hero in flesh and blood it's, it's probably perceived as like the big brain hero right there's a lot of thinking to be done there's a lot of understanding i mean it is and there isn't i i agree with you to to like a lot of those points right about just kind of what the deck's trying to do and and how you need to learn the play lines but honestly i think once you learn those things like the the deck does become really firstly really fun to play playing kano decks um but also just really interesting you find new lines all the time which is, is really cool i think because of this ability you've got so many there's so many i guess branches you can go off in any four card hand because you've got access to the top of your deck you've got uh and what what could that card be you know so immediately you open up sort of these just crazy amount of possibilities that uh lines of play that kano could have in any particular turn yeah so like you said kano is often touted as the hardest hero to play in flesh and blood from an like an intellectual capacity perspective i guess the decision trees get out of hand very quickly because you have the uh, ability to utilize the top of your deck and unknown information but the upside is that kano usually has a way to win um even when the situation looks quite dire his his a hero ability of the you know effectively play three draw card is just a portal into the multiverse right because you have things like tome of aether when you have sonic booms like you have these really really just unusual out sometimes it can help you win games that you had no no right winning to an extent um from a competitive standpoint it's hard to say i think if we're talking about decks that are meta calls like kano just like really really is that um there's multiple versions right the tempo version if people are not on uh arcane barrier the tempo version can see a lot of success and then the combo version as well uh that is less about arcane barrier but also a meta call all versions of kano do struggle into illusionist cool where's your next all right, so next up we have Icelander. This is sort of this is the last hero for us. This is the new wizard out of Uprising. It is a ice wizard that can play out of its arsenal. Can't play at the same sort of instant speed as Kano. Doesn't have that in, you know that uh, that hero ability of banishing across the top and playing at uh, a lot of cards of instant speed. Instead, it does it out of its arsenal via a blue card. Also, is a frost hero, which gives it an ability to sort of. Um, detract from the opponent's game plan, right? Give them frostbite, slow them down, ice source, ice deflections, things like that. 
Now, Iceland is like a, a merge between Alexi and, and Kano in some ways. You know, you've got the disruptive, the hate element that is the kind of ice-based deck, you know, and you've got access to all the new cars, not just Channel Lake Frigid and, and things like Winter's Bite, but now Arctic Incarceration, um, Hypothermia, Channel the Bleak Expanse, all these options to play in an ice deck. Plus you have this, this win condition, this kind of like attrition kind of um, like semi combo end up that you can set up in the end game with frost hex so really interesting sort of ice dynamic then plus you just get to play wizard cards as well if you want to and be a wizard deck um i guess the biggest like i guess detractor from icelander is that you don't get to play like a cano deck and that's a very unique play style so i think if you are looking at playing something like icelander you should approach it completely differently to how you'd approach a deck like kano because it is, it is so so different it is I honestly think from playing a few games, it's not even in the same realm. Like, they're not the same sort of things. Other than the fact they interact with arcane damage, use arcane damage, I don't think the heroes are even kind of remotely the same, to be honest. And so from a competitive standpoint, um, all we can say about Iceland, I think, right now is just that the jury is not out. Uh, still <laughs> much to see, I think, from this hero. There are multiple archetypes probably able to be played, one that utilizes more arcane damage, but I think that attack actions are also very playable in Iceland. We've already started to see that. And maybe the sweet spot is somewhere in between. All right, Hayden. So just quickly, let's let's do some closing thoughts. Uh, so picking your hero in Flesh and Blood, just to circle back from the to the very beginning, is just really determining how you want to spend your time, uh, choosing your your sort of experience in this game. Um, I think that getting a good idea of what the other heroes offer in terms of uh, play style and even competitive viability is important before you potentially maybe invest in some of those cards or put in a lot of time to something maybe you don't like. Uh, but my recommendation, and I know this is circling back to the first question of should you play multiple heroes in Flesh and Blood, I think you should try a lot. I think you should try a lot of heroes, figure out what you like and what works for you, and then go with whatever whatever experiences you find the most enjoyable. I think Limited is a great place to learn sort of the mechanics of the heroes and how they work and the play patterns. And if you like that kind of style, uh, that's why I think Limited is such an important aspect of Flesh and Blood and a great place to start. And then, yeah, I mean, it kind of depends what you want to get out of it. If you're looking to be more competitive, but you still want to play in that sort of one hero space, then, you know, look to the heroes that have consistently sort of put up results and maybe the, the classes where you can invest into and uh, and play those. So, you know, it is Illusionist maybe that, you know, Runeblade, like Guardian, like those are the kind of ones that, that come to mind immediately in terms of looking for trying to play on that aspect or just whatever you enjoy, you know. And like Brennan says, I, I do agree, try and play a few things, maybe play a main hero, but then have a couple of others up your sleeve. Awesome. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. On to this week's Google review. But before I get into it, Hayden, why don't you tell people, if people want to get their review featured on Arsenal Pass, how do they do it? And I'm actually going to interrupt you before you do that because I have something that came to me. Hayden can't see this because he can't see my camera. But a few more of these came in. They're very limited edition. I don't even I don't even think Hayden has a few of them. These are the Arsenal Pass Life Pads. You might have seen us playing with them in person. I'm going to give one of these out to whoever has the funniest and most creative review for next week. There's not a lot of these. No other person outside of me and Hayden actually owns one of these right now. So if you want one of these and you think you can you can make me and Hayden laugh, next week's review anyway and tell them how they can get their review featured yeah, you get your review into rate this podcast.com forward slash arsenal pass and uh, it'll let you just hit your preferred platform wherever you like to listen leave us a review it does help us immensely so we thank you in advance it just gets us out to to more listeners and uh with that brendan on to you awesome so our review this week is from s t boy this is a hard one to say s underscore t b y n u m two <laughs> Five stars. Uh, it says, great fab podcast. My favorite one that I listen to. A really versatile podcast that provides uh, an overview of the current environment, commentary on some of the top decks and approaches, some discussion of key uh, key points and strategies and questions and answers from listeners. It is accessible to players of all levels, includes service level conversations, understandable for new players, as well as some good points and observations useful for the most experienced players as well. This, provide, this podcast provides a great weekly update that is essential and useful for the those of us in isolated areas to provide us with more exposure to the wider community mixes in some great humor as well as banter between Brennan and Hayden and draws you into the conversation and makes you feel like you're a part of the team. Thank you so much for that five-star review. Um, and hopefully I'm, I'm really excited when usually we put up these prizes, people come up with some really creative ones like, uh, you know, the second most popular man on Twitter, but Hey, why don't you sign us off this week? We've got a, uh, we've got a fab fitness call on the Patreon discord to get to. 
Yeah, I mean, I have a favorite review which we haven't read yet, so I need to get that on the the one of the pods. It's my it's my favorite by a mile. It made me laugh hysterically. So that's gonna be coming in the next few weeks. But yeah, do do get reviews in if you want them. That's a very nice review actually. I was waiting for the punchline. Um, that's gonna be it for this week. If you uh, are not already checking out our content that we're putting up on YouTube, please go and do so. We've just put up a, uh, a Viserai deck tech from Road to National season. Uh, deck guide is up on Patreon as well. We're also on Twitter. Me and Brendan. Brendan is at Brendan APG. I'm at Fian underscore Dale. Come and interact with us on the Flesh and Blood community Twitter. Uh, it's kind of blowing up with the Fab Fitness Challenge plus just you know Road to National season. Lots of stuff. Lots of discourse happening there. So you can find us there. And a big thank you to all of our patrons uh, for all that you enable us to do. Until next week, Brendan. We'll uh, see you next time. Yeah, everyone.